Video input. All right, let's see. Is that better? Sound? Yes. Not still. Yay? Is that a yay for audio? Okay, good. So everybody can hear the audio now? Okay, cool. It looks like it's actually, the input is really high. So tell me if I'm shouting or something. All right, excellent. All right, hi everybody. Happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers and also happy Father's Day to those of you who have fathers. Um, hope you're having a good day. And uh, I already got up and had breakfast made for me, so that was nice. And then we uh, took a long walk. Uh, so I'm a little hot and sweaty, but that's okay. I have water, so that's good. Um, so how's everybody doing out there? Let me see if this is all set up. Cool. All right, I have my swashbuckler shirt on today. Uh, not sure why, and I also brought some stuff to uh, show you guys. Um, just a little show and tell. Let me see if I can hold this up to the camera. Uh, this is the Kansas Fest pin, which I just got in. Can everybody see that? So anybody who signed up for uh, Virtual Kansas Fest, uh, you'll be getting one of these pins in the mail. So I just got 400 of them. Um, I also got some stickers. So here's a Knox Archaist sticker. You'll be getting one of those. Um, so, oh, by the way, this is, this is from Kansas Fest, not from me. But uh, so that's what your $20 paid for. And then the rest of this stuff is like free goodies. Uh, I've got some postcards that I had made up. So I'm gonna throw those in there. And it has a little advertisement on the back for my uh, little t-shirt store. And then we also have some uh, postcards from Eaten by a Gru, which is the podcast from uh, Kay Savitz and Carrington, um, as well as a couple other little postcards and goodies and some Kansas Fest stickers. So those of you that signed up for that, look for that. Um, I'm still waiting on the Kansas Fest stickers. They're hopefully going to come in next week, and so then I'll be able to mail out all of the envelopes by July 1st. So you should, um, if you're within the U.S., you should get them well before Kansas Fest. Uh, international, I'm not quite sure uh, how long it'll actually take. It seems like the mail is pretty slow these days, especially uh, to Europe. So hopefully you'll still get it before Kansas Fest starts. And if you haven't signed up for uh, Kansas Fest, it's july 24th to 25th um so it'll be two days of virtual talks about the apple II, uh atari we've got some um cool uh video like readings from uh stuff that case Savitz is going to do we're going to have a, a hackathon in the evening uh and then as well as like uh, virtual board games and things like that so that'll be in the evening and then um yeah so look forward to that and just go to kansasfest.org to sign up for that. Cool. So let's take a look at what's going on on the board. Um, so last time, here we go. So last time, I think last week, we had left it where I just started putting in um, some of the sockets. I can't remember exactly where I left off, but I'm basically, I am done soldering. So. If I can, well, I'll just hold it up to the, uh, the camera too. So every, everything is soldered in. And let me move this back a little bit. Maybe you can actually see it. The cord is kind of in the way here. Um, yeah, so I've got everything soldered in. So all 2,170 uh, solder points are done. So there's that was the front. Here is the back of the board. Um, so you can see all that and I'll flip it around so you can see the other side there of it. And yeah, so it all went together actually really easily after the hardest part was definitely the resistors and the capacitors uh, and just finding out where they all go. The actual sockets for the chips were pretty straightforward. Um, the only trick there is to make sure that you have them all aligned the correct direction. Um, and yeah, I didn't, as far as I know, I didn't make any mistakes except, you know, on the rest of it, 
The only mistake I made um, near the beginning was those two transistors that I soldered in backwards. Um, the rest of it though was was pretty straightforward. I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you let me pull this up a little bit, there. Um, there's three places on the board which use these special white sockets. So there's the joystick connector right there. So that's the game connector there. There is the first ROM socket here in row E. So that's position E3. And then finally the keyboard connector uh, down at the bottom. And those uh, white sockets are there just to indicate that that's where the user um, plugs something in. So it's just a, a visual reminder. There's nothing actually different about those sockets um, other than that's where those plug. So they're actually, um, for this one, the, the, the RAM one is a little bit interesting. That's if you have a language card. So a 16K language card, those, uh, some of them come with a ribbon cable and you actually take out the last chip of RAM and you plug in the ribbon cable from the card. And then typically you would actually take that RAM chip and put it into the, uh, the RAM card itself. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, what else? If you're doing this board, the sockets for the um, video and the cassette are actually, you need a lot of solder for those. So if I can hold it up a little bit closer. Um, so you can see there, those holes are actually huge. And so that took quite a bit of heat and solder to fill those in. So just be aware of that when you're doing um, when you're doing those and I'm trying to think, I think that was about it. Um, so what I did after I was done with the entire board is I washed the back of it with 91% isopropyl alcohol and that was to clean off all of the flux that was left over from the solder. Um, so the solder that I have has a flux core in it. I ended up originally when I was First, I think in the first video I was using uh, like a flux pen for every single uh, point that I was soldering, but it turned out that I realized I didn't really need to use that since the solder I was using had flux in it. And that the flux, um, it, it both cleans the, cleans the wire where you're trying to solder and it also makes the solder flow much more evenly. Um, but it leaves behind a residue, um, which can be a little bit corrosive. So you wanna wash that off afterward. And then I just dried it. Let's see, so Chris, um, Chris Auger is asking, did Henry correct the mislabeled uh, 74LS74 near the game connector? Um, he did not, I believe. Hold on, let me check. I've got an older board here. Yeah, so Chris is correct. On this board, If I don't know if you can, if I hold it up close enough. So this is an original board here, and you can see this chip here um, it's a 74 LS74, and I believe that is that connected with the, the video or something. Um, what does that say it actually does? Oh, it's the cassette and the speaker um, chip. So on Henry's PCB board, that's actually mislabeled as a 74 LS174. So just be aware of that. Um, because I think there actually are some 174s, if I'm correct. Is that right? Yes. There's actually, I think, three uh, 74LS 174s on the board, so don't put one of them in there. So that's still labeled incorrectly. So, yeah, so Chris, you are absolutely right. That's still labeled wrong. Um, as far as other things that were wrong, there was the... The 12 volt line that we talked about last time on the auxiliary video connector and that one we just had to do the little jumper wire right there. Um, so that was one thing that was incorrect. There was a resistor down here R1 which was actually um, the hole through the board actually chopped chopped out the actual number so that you can't read, but that's our resistor R1. And then other changes. So this is a replica of an Apple II Plus, so the RFI board, uh, but there's a couple changes. So this board actually uses 
um, 27, um, what are they, 2716, is that right, 2716 ROMs, instead of the er, original 9316 ROMs, and because of that, Henry had to actually add an extra chip here, and so you can see uh, this 74LS04, and that's just to allow those ROMs, the chip enable lines on those ROMs to work properly. Um, other than that, the board is identical for the most part to a regular um, RFI Apple II Plus. Okay, cool. And then Chris says that he points out that Henry's actually fixing that missing 12 volt um, um, trace that goes to the header. All right, so I thought what I would do today is actually just try and start sticking in some chips and um, maybe see what we can get to actually work. And I don't know whether we'll get through the whole thing or not, but um, we can try. So let's maybe move this around a little bit um, so you can see. And what I want to do, I've got a multimeter here. Um, and I'm just going to put this on continuity testing. So let me throw this here. And I'm not sure if you can actually hear it beeping, but when I touch the two um, leads together, then it beeps. And so that indicates that there's uh, continuity or a direct connection between those two lines. And I thought what I would do is just sort of like trace out a few of these just to make sure that things look uh, correct before we actually start plugging in any chips. So what I'm going to do first, if we look at the power connector here, there's six different um, pins that go in here. And by the way, if you haven't, um, if you haven't downloaded this cheat sheet, do a, a do a either a Google search or I'll put it up somewhere on the website. There's a chart out there called the uh, IC. Um, I guess it's called the IC arbitrary chart. Basically, it's a chart of all of the Apple II chips on the board and kind of a rough diagram of what all the chips do. Um, and this thing is actually really valuable just to kind of find your way around the board and figure out what things are. Uh, but it doesn't label everything. So I've gone in and made some extra annotations, for example, for the power lines. So if we just take this, and what I want to do first is just look at the power lines themselves. And it's going to be a little hard to actually see what I'm doing. Um, why is it so dark? Hold on, I'm going to turn on another light just to make it easier to see. Hey Mark, how's it going? All right, good. John says that you can actually hear the little beep. Um, so if you look at the multimeter here, hopefully you can see that. Um, obviously everybody's multimeter is a little bit different, but most of them have a way to test continuity and they'll usually be tied to um, something to check resistances. So here you can see, here's the ohms and the very last setting on that has a little thing that looks like uh, sound out. And so that just, um, essentially, it's testing whether there's zero resistance between two points, um, which, of course, there never actually would be completely zero. And you can see when I touch them, I can get that to stand up. The resistance drops down to uh, close to zero, like that. So, hey, so Mark just joined us. Uh, so Mark Lambert, in case you don't know, he's the, the lead developer on uh, Nox Archaist, the, the new... Um, computer role-playing game for the Apple II. And um, we're actually going to do a session at Kansas Fest about Nox Archaist. So if you're uh, signed up for that, you'll be able to catch that. I think it's going to, right now it's scheduled for Saturday morning. Uh, so I guess it'll be like July 25th. Um, so that'll be me, Mark, and uh, uh, Jared, who are going to be doing a session on Nox Archaist. And we'll show off the splash screen and a little bit of the gameplay. Um, and we're kind of in the home stretch. Of that, Mark is busily uh, doing his final testing right now before we send it out to the beta testers. Um, so that's really exciting. So yeah, so what I want to do, I'm just going to touch the um, the two ground lines here. Okay, and you can see, okay, those are connected. And what I want to do is I'm actually going to touch, so I'm holding the black to the ground, and I'm just touching all the other pins. And I don't want to hear anything because I definitely don't want, say, for example, the plus five volt line to be connected. Uh, to the to the ground line that would be bad um, 
and then I can go around and I can say, well, let's let's put the the uh, multimeter probe on the plus five volt line, and I know that that's going to be on one of these traces that goes all the way along the board, um, and I can just sort of feel that out and make sure that things are connected. Um, on the 6502, which is the brains of the Apple II Plus, that's the uh, the main chip there in the middle. Um, I believe it's pin eight. Let me double check that. Um, let's see, pin number, yeah, pin number eight is the plus five volt line. So if I put my lead there and then count over from pin number one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so you can hear that beep. Um, and it doesn't beep for any other ones. So that is good because that sort of indicates that, you know, at least from this plus five volt line all the way over to the pin on the 6502, uh, they're connected correctly. And you can just kind of go around the whole board and touch off various points and you can look up on the schematic you know, for example, one thing to try might be look at the, all the peripheral slots. Um, and obviously don't try all the pins, but make sure that the, say, the, the plus 5 or the plus 12 volt line are, for all those are connected properly. Um, Chris, I'd be, I'd be curious if you're still on, did you, what kind of other testing did you actually do on the board before you, you know, before you started plugging in chips? Did you do any other, um, any other diagnostics that you might recommend? Um, just for people who are building this, just to be somewhat reasonably confident that they've done it correctly. Um, and while, let's see, if in doubt, power up the board without the ICs installed. Yeah, actually, we could just try that right now. Um, you can see, I forgot to point out, um, you know, the one thing that I did solder in that's probably the most important thing on here, I mean, obviously everything's important, but um, this down here is the 14 megahertz crystal. And this, along with the circuitry down here with the transistors, um, actually it controls all of the different timings within the board. So that 14 megahertz uh, gets split up into 7 megahertz and then 3, because um, it, needs, it needs 3 megahertz for the, uh, for the color signal. And then finally it gets divided down to 1 megahertz to go to the actual CPU. Um, and that's the actual speed of the board. So this is, you know critical comp component down here. So let's see. Power with the board with us measure one chip of each voltage type. Yeah, okay, so let's do that. Let's go ahead and we'll power it up um, and we'll just cross our fingers. I haven't actually, and I'm, just in case you're wondering, this is the truth, I have not actually plugged it power into this thing at all, so I actually don't know what's going to happen, um, but we'll find out. So let me rearrange a couple cables here. So my power supply is a little um, janky, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to anybody else. It's actually just a, a naked board. Um, so this is the uh, Ultimate Micro uh, Power Supply Kit, and I didn't have an extra case for this one. So I just have it um, just sort of out in the open. I would definitely not recommend doing things this way. Um, it's best to get a working power supply, either uh, a new one like this, but within the case, um, or an old one is fine also. And I have an old one as well that we could use. Um, but this one, I've already powered on my other uh, Rev7 board with this one, and it works fine. Um, so this is what we'll use. And... Hey, Silence. Good to see you again. Uh, let me make sure everything is still there. All right, we're gonna plug that in. So at least it, at least it plugged in. Um, I wanna make sure, hold on one second. Here's my power switch. All right, I'm gonna flip this on. Okay, so I turned it on. 
nothing exploded so that's good um, if we wanted to we could measure some voltages so I know for example and this is where you know you got to be careful now because this actually has even though you can't tell this has live power going to the board uh, so there's plus and minus 5 volts and plus and minus 12 volts so you definitely don't want to be shorting anything out at this point because um, you could damage either the power supply um, or perhaps something on the board so what I'm going to do is right now I know I'm going to put the multimeter uh, can you see that yeah um, I'm going to put it on DC and I'll put it on 20 so that'll be the maximum and then I'm going to touch the so this should be a ground here on the outside of the composite video and then on the speaker this should be plus the the pin closest to the keyboard should be plus five all right and you can see i'm actually getting 5.19 volts so that's a good thing um let's see what else can we test on the keyboard i'm trying to think um i can't remember which pin on the key does anybody remember on the keyboard connector it's either pin three or pin eight is plus five volts. Um, does anybody remember? Oh, pin on the video header for plus 12, that's good. Okay, so put that there. Yep, all right, so I don't know if you can see that, but so that Chris is saying, touch the uh, leftmost pin on the video header and I'm getting 11.82 volts on that. So that's plus 12. Um, that's good. Pin 12 to 24 on a ROM is a good 5 volts. Okay, so here's the ROMs here. And so you can see the white dot there, that's pin 1. So that's going to go all the way up 1 through 12 and then uh, 13 through 24. So he is saying pins 12... 224 all right so if I just touch that one there and put that there are you saying that okay so there's five volts so that's pin 24 on one of the ROMs let me try another one there's another plus five plus five, plus five. All right, so I think that seems pretty good. Oh, measure across 12 and 24, okay, thank you. All right, so let's try that. So here's pin 12, and there is pin 24. Yep, so we get 5.19. And sorry, my hands are in the way there. I'm basically measuring, so here's pin 12 on the ROM, and then down in the lower left corner of the ROM is pin 24. So I'm just putting the multimeter across that. Um, and he's, yeah, 12 is ground, right. Cool. All right, well, let's, let me see if I can actually get the multimeter to, or the uh, oscilloscope to work. Um, and we'll see if we can actually measure the, uh, the um, crystal to see if we can see that. So... I haven't used this multimeter, I mean this oscilloscope, and I'm going to keep calling it a multimeter. Um, I haven't actually used this oscilloscope very much, so I'm going to have to remember how it actually works here. Um, I've got to move my chips out of the way. Hold on. All right, so we want... Let's see. Um, where is a good ground line? I need to be able to reach. Hold on one second. Um, I don't know how far this is actually going to reach. Hey, Chris, do you have any recommendations for where to plug in the ground for the... Uh for the oscilloscope, I want to I want to be able to reach all the way.
All right, here we go. This won't be the best, but. Yes, silence, you need to get one and then you need to make videos um, and you can do it like correctly and fix all the mistakes that I've made. Um, all right, so there's, I've attached that to the, the ground. Um, and I'm just sort of touching this to that and seeing, and hold on one second, I'll, I'll, I'll put it so you can actually see it in a second. Um, seconds per division. All right, so let me let me see if I can point the camera at the oscilloscope there, and it's right behind my head. Hold on. All right, can everybody see that? All right, so I. All right, so I'm getting a signal there. see pretty exciting stuff here so what I've done is I've put the probe for the oscilloscope um, one end is on ground and then the other um, the actual probe part is on the leg of the crystal um, and hold on am I getting actually what I'm expecting so I've got this set to 0.1 microseconds per division. So somebody do the math here. Um, so it's a little less than 0.1. It's about point, the period is about 0.7, no, 0 0.07 microseconds. Does that sound correct? Uh, let's see, and then Chris says pin 10 of B2 should also have the clock. Uh, so B2, um, how many is this? Yeah, there we go. All right, so that's what I get with uh, pin 10 at location B2. So, 0 0.07 microseconds. Um, so Chris, is that, that's what it should be, is that right? He's saying it should be 0 0.09, 0 0.06988 uh, microseconds should be 14 uh, megahertz. And so I, you know, with my very crude measurement, um, that looks actually pretty good. This is this is as high as my uh, oscilloscope will go out. It's a it's a 20 megahertz oscilloscope, um, so I can't get it to go any higher than that. But uh, so I think that actually looks pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't know, Chris. Anything else that you um, that you recommend other than just starting to uh, obviously take you know unplug the power and start putting in chips? I'm kind of um, actually curious. One thing I thought about trying is actually figuring out what's the, like the minimum number of chips that you have to put in uh, to get like a clock signal at the 6502. Because um, I think that actually might be kind of cool to, to look at as well. Um, but I'm not quite sure how to figure that out. So here's the board. Um, so what I was doing before with the probe so I've got the, uh, the ground is just attached all the way on the other side of the board. Um, 
And then here's the actual probe itself. And I was just touching either the leg of the oscilloscope or I was touching pin number 10 over here um, at chip location B2 uh, because that's where the 14 megahertz line goes into the chip. Um, hey, Andre, uh, good to see you. Yeah, no worries about missing part two. Um, you can always go back on YouTube and catch it. And then I figured out how to embed the, uh, the comments. Um, so everybody's comments are on there. So let me go ahead. I'm going to power this off now. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and start putting in chips. Um, so I should point out that I'm probably not doing things quite uh, the safest way. And people are always calling out me out for this on my videos, and I really should um, probably be better. I'm not using like a, a, a wrist strap uh, for static electricity. Um, you know, I'm doing this on a, a table, which is a folding table, which which probably picks up a lot of static electricity. Um, I've never had any problems, but probably if you're you know if you're more worried about those things, you might want to. Invest in a good static mat and a, a wrist strap. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Um, one thing I was going to point out, just some uh, handy references. So let me fold this up. Um, if you don't have a copy of the Apple II circuit description, by uh, Winston Gaylor, uh, you should go out and find the PDF for it or look for it on eBay. Um, it's definitely invaluable. It has uh, schematics at the back as well as all sorts of um, timing charts. So if I can throw that into the thing. So basically it gives you all of the uh, timing charts for all the signals on the board. So that's, that's a really invaluable reference. Um, and then also uh, Jim Sather's Understanding the Apple II. So both those books are sort of, you know, definitely required, um, not required, but, you know, super helpful if you're trying to figure out, um, you know, how to diagnose a board or just how it actually works. Um, so I've kind of, you know, read these cover to cover before, um, and I'm sure I'll keep reading it because I always forget stuff that's in it. So. If you don't already have those, go out and look for the PDFs. They're freely available and you can easily find them. So let's go ahead and we'll just start putting in chips. And what I've done, I'm trying to move the oscilloscope out of the way. Um, I'm gonna double check all of these, but basically what I did is I took all the chips from Henry that he supplied in the kit and I just arranged them all in a big matrix there with numbers um, because they were sort of jumbled on his actual, um, you know, the way he shipped them to me. And so I just went through and I just uh, read them all because um, the numbers are a little bit hard to see. So I'd recommend doing that first before you go ahead and, you know, try and install them one at a time and, you know, read them as you're doing it. Um, and then some of the more obvious chips, you know, like the 6502 or the ROMs, you don't really need to, you know, organize those because um, that's pretty pretty obvious um, yeah okay good and as Chris points out so Gaylor's uh, book is very good and let's see install B1 and B2 and 6502 phase 0 and 7M should be up all right let's try that so if we put in B1 and B2 so B1 down here in the lower left uh, which you probably can't see anymore because it's no longer in the frame um, that hold on one second um so that's a b1 is a 74 ls 175 and so if we just look on my decoder chart um and i'm just going to double check all of these to make sure so 74 ls 175 and then obviously when you're putting these in you want to make sure that the notch um aligns with the notch on the board and for all of these chips uh, the notch goes towards the bottom of the board or towards the keyboard end um, and one thing I forgot to do so most ICs like this when you uh, when you get them the legs are always spread a little bit too far 
And so you always end up having to sort of bend them um, just a little bit. And they actually, and I just take it and I just sort of roll it on the desk uh, to bend the legs a little bit closer. Um, they actually sell like a little, I don't know what it would be called, a tool that makes that easy to do. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have it. And then, you know, when you're putting them in, one thing to uh, just double check is to make sure that all the pins are actually uh, in the socket and one of them isn't sticking out because uh, that's a really common uh, thing to have happen. So the next chip over at B2 is, 74, uh, is a 74S86. So where is my um, 86? Here it is. And there's only one of those on the board. Um, and I'm just going to roll the, the pins a little bit just to make them stand straighter. And make sure the socket's in the correct direction. Okay, uh, exciting stuff here. So yeah, pin, okay, so XOT, uh, how you doing? Uh, he says a pin straightener is a good investment. Uh, saves a lot of time in broken pins, definitely. Um, yeah, maybe I should actually go and look for one of those on eBay. Unfortunately, it's too late for this kit. All right, so now that we have those two in, let's go ahead and we're going to plug the power back in and see if we can measure the um, phase uh, phase zero clock over where the 6502 is. So let me move this down here. And actually, I'm just going to plug the power back in. Make sure that's off. Uh, all right, and then where is my scope probe here? Uh, I'm gonna just put that on ground. So I've just got that, in case you're wondering, I've got that plugged, I don't know if you can see it. Um, there. So I've got the, the, the ground end of the probe plugged, just attached to the uh, composite, the ground on the composite video. And then we will check, I believe it's pin 37 on the 6502 socket. Um, and so let's see if we turn on the power. Okay. So this is pin 40, 39, 38, 37. And uh, oops. So hold on one second. Let me see. I'm going to show you the. There's the oscilloscope. Um, check pin six of B1. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so there's pin six. Hmm, it doesn't look very, it doesn't look very stable. Does that look? Can you see that? Does that, that does not look like what it should look like, does it? Do you think I need? Uh, do you think I need to have more chips in there to actually get it to to settle down? It doesn't look normal. Yeah. All right. Um, let me just keep going. So that was a good try, but we'll just hope everything's okay and keep going and uh, see what happens. So let me turn that off. Let me unplug everything just in case. All right. Unplug that. All right. So let's just... I guess we'll just keep going along and um, 
just start filling in chips. We don't have to fill in all of them, so we definitely don't have to do all of the RAM, um, and we don't have to do all the ROM either uh, before we can actually just fire it up. So here, let's put the camera back there uh, and down. All right, so we were just doing that with these two chips, but apparently that's not enough to actually test. Um, so let's keep going. So this one, this little guy here, this is a 555 timer. So this is a little timer chip. Um, and let's make sure. Yeah, it's a 555. Um, that chip there actually controls the uh, repeat for the keyboard. Um, so when you hold down the, uh, if I, I think that's correct. Um, when you hold down the repeat key, that um, fires off the timer, which then tells it how long. Um, oops, kind of bent that too far. Hold on one second. Yeah, this is where the uh, the chip spreader probably would be very handy, right? Okay, there we go. That one's in. Um, yeah, so these capacitors right down here and resistors uh, determine the repeat rate for the uh, keyboard. So if you actually change that uh, capacitor or the resistor, it would actually change the, the, the frequency of that. Um, all right, so let's just keep plugging in chips here. So next one is the LS194. Um, and sorry, this is going to take quite a while. So if you want to uh, talk about other stuff, give me a topic or something like that, we can, uh, we can chat about something. Um, that's a one nine five. Hold on. That's a one nine five. We need a one nine four. That's an LS thirty two. Uh, I bumped my chips in there. Okay, so there's a one ninety four. Okay, good. So put that in um, ah, yes and the legs are definitely not cooperating with this I know I'm gonna goober one of these up and then I'm gonna be sad but it's sort of inevitable okay 174 um, so there's one of those 174s that's actually correct. So 174. Do you have a speaker on hand? Yes. I have a speaker right here uh, that I cannibalized out of an Apple IIe. So, and then we can actually, we can plug it in. I don't have a keyboard um, because I don't want to actually uh, take anything out of my Apple II Plus, uh, but we can still hook it up to a monitor and at least it'll still uh, it'll still start out start up without a keyboard. Um, we just won't be able to type anything. Um, so yeah, I've got the speaker and I've got that. God, these are these are kind of a pain in the in the butt to do. Um, all right, that looks good. Before I smash it down. Okay, the next one is a 257. This is some thrilling YouTube here. Pretty exciting stuff. Okay, that one's in. Uh, there's another 257 right there. Um, let's double check that. Yeah, and here, let's, if we have the little chart, um, maybe I'll try and follow along what's going on here. So those 257s, I believe those are connected to the keyboard, right? Yeah, so one of them is like the keyboard buffer. Um, and the other one is, is, what is it doing? Yeah, they're both keyboard buffer things. Um, so do we need to be concerned about static discharge? Hey, Eric. Um, so we don't need to be super concerned and so this is what Chris um, was pointing out a little earlier um, because these are um, TTL chips they are a little bit more robust um, like more modern chips or CMOS chips 
um, are a little bit more susceptible to static electricity. Um, but TTL chips, which is what all these are, are um, not as susceptible to static electricity. So you don't need to be super concerned. Um, hold on, just looking for the next chip. I have, that's the wrong one, that's a 194. Um, I have actually, I have actually fried um, a couple of these chips before, but that was because I was incredibly stupid and I brushed the dust off of a CRT monitor and then went and touched the board. Um, and I could clearly actually hear the, the, the spark of electricity. Um, so unless you're, uh, you know, unless you do something foolish like that, you don't need to worry as much about static electricity. Um, so yeah. Hold on, that one is not going to go. In. No, that one, that one doesn't look right. Uh, I think I bent that pin, so hold on. I'm gonna get a chip puller. And find her. Where, I don't know where my chip puller went. Uh, let's see. Don't wear polyester or wool. Yeah, that's... Yeah, and, and don't... I, I wouldn't recommend a slumming this on, a, like, a carpet. Um, that might be bad, too. All right, so you can see here... So look at that. that I already messed up that pin on that chip. Um, I think I really should have bought one of those... Uh, like XOT was saying, I should have bought a chip straightener. I didn't really think about it with this many chips to put in. I suppose worst case, if I break one of these pins, I can cannibalize. I have a spare uh, Rev7 board, um, the one that I've been using just to check all of my capacitors and resistors. And so worst case, I could just cannibalize that but I really don't want to actually ruin any of these chips if I can help it. Okay, that looks much better. Okay, so next is another 194, um, or the 194, I should say. So this is a 194, yep. And what does that say? 194. Can't read it. Ram video something or other. Um, maybe somebody can look up what that one does. That's at B9, location B9 on the board. Um, and you know, like I was saying, the first, I think the very first video that I did on here, um, you know, the cool thing about the Apple II Plus is it's actually. Um, it's all off the shelf components. So, you know, that was the cool thing back in the day. They didn't have any custom chips that they needed to manufacture, um, except for programming the ROMs, but everything else was just off the shelf. And that wasn't true of like the Apple IIe, um, which started to actually, you know, that's when Apple started to use custom chips. And so that makes it harder. You now somebody was asking, well, how come they don't, you know, how come Henry doesn't do a clone of the Apple IIe? Um, and part of the reason why is because it's just uh, harder to actually uh, source the chips. You know, in that case, it's easier to just you know program them um, yourself using some sort of um, different chip. Hold on, let's see what am I looking for. I'm looking for a 74 LS74. Okay. Yep, that's a 74. Um, poly wool blend. Yeah, sure. Just go for the poly wool blend. I would say. Um, how many chips in total? Well, let's see. There are, I can count them all, but maybe an easier way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven rows. What's seven times 14? That's 49, 98. So a little less than a hundred chips. Um, and it's actually a little bit, it's even less than that because some of the chips take up two spots like the, uh, 
the ROMs, and then obviously the 6502. So somewhere around probably 90, 90 chips total. Um, and then eight, uh, 24 of those are gonna be RAM. And then there's six ROM chips. Uh, one video uh, or keyboard um, or video chip which actually controls what the characters look like on the screen um, and yeah and then the rest are just kind of like lots and lots of um, kind of like I, I don't know glue logic and things like that like NAND gates and ORs and you know ANDs and things like that um, and then like the 555 timers to uh, to do things so I don't, you know, I have to admit, I don't, I don't understand, you know, the board entirely and what everything does, but I think, you know, it actually would not be hard to sit down with the schematic over a weekend and just kind of go through the entire thing and figure out, you know, what every single chip does basically, um, you know, and, and what, you know, Steve Wozniak was thinking when he designed it, etc. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of it is that, you know, you, you could understand the entire thing, whereas, you know, maybe with like a modern, you know, like a, a MacBook or, a, you know, a laptop, you know, Windows laptop or something like that. It'd be, you know, so hard to understand what was going on in the actual circuit diagram. Okay, let's see. 74 LS11. I got to make sure to not be too distracted when I'm doing this. Um, luckily, a lot of these are just single. There's only one of them. So... Yeah, Andre, that's a... He's asking, what do, what, what do I do about a case for this? Um... That's a really great question. I think, you know, in Henry's mind, uh, hopefully that noise wasn't bad. Um, LSO2, LSO2. Um, so I think, you know, Henry is kind of selling this kit as a drop-in replacement for an Apple II Plus uh, or an Apple II. Um, and so his thought is kind of treat it the same way as the, um, his power supplies. So if you have a board that isn't working, um, or you just want to extend the life of your, um, Apple II, you want, in other words, you want to use it, but you don't want to be actually using the original board from, you know, back in the day. Um, then you would just get one of these kits. And so you, essentially you would just take out your old motherboard, put in this new one, um, and then, you know, put the old one away and never look at it. Um, you know, keep it in, for posterity and pass it down to the children or something like that. Um, I'm not going to do that. My Apple II Plus is actually working fine, and I don't need to. I don't. I don't know. I'd rather actually just use the Apple II Plus. Um, you know, without thinking that oh, I actually have a clone board inside of it. Um, but I was kind of thinking, you know, there was that Kickstarter. Um, about six months ago that failed, which was for a clear Apple II Plus case, and then they just revamped the Kickstarter to do it, but for an Apple IIe. Um, and actually, I backed that one. And so I was kind of thinking, um, you know, maybe if they actually come back with that clear case Apple II Plus, I would just kind of hold out for that. Um, but if not, I'll just keep it as a spare board and just play around with it. And um, I'm always needing a board to actually test things on, and I hate to test things on my on my original Apple II Plus from my childhood um, in case I goof it up. So you know, I'd much rather have just a spare that I can pull out, um, like this one. Which you know, first of all, I'm not as worried if something goes wrong, and then second of all, you know, it's probably a little bit sturdier than my old one. Um, so I'll probably just. I won't use it day to day. I'll just keep it as kind of a backup. Um, and having said all that, then Chris also points out that, you know, you can just go on eBay and buy a case. So uh, maybe I'll just do that as well. Because um, actually I want to get, um, what I really want to get is a power supply, um, at least the shell, and then also a replacement keyboard. Because um, I'm always having to pull the keyboard out of my Apple II Plus to test something. Um, you know, I have this spare board already, um, but I don't have a spare keyboard. So I feel bad that I'm always, you know, pulling the keyboard out of my two plus because I know someday I'm gonna, I'm gonna damage something. So this, this is a real pain. This one. 
Um, all right, so, so far, I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, 166, 166, and that's good. Um, yeah, Herb, maybe, um, good point. Maybe I should make a, a case out of wood. Actually, that would be kind of a cool project. Um, I sometimes make little pieces of furniture and stuff out of wood, so that would be kind of fun. And then it would be kind of like the old Apple One where you didn't actually get a case and then people would just make them out of wood and um, so everybody's case looked a little bit different. So, all right, uh, 74 LS257. Um, 257, 257. That's this one. Just double checking, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I do. I have an old briefcase, so I could do that too. Um, it'd be kind of fun. Create some sort of Frankenstein Apple II Plus. Uh, now I need a 151. I sure wish I actually knew uh, what all these were. That is not a 151, that's an 04. Um, I think if you've been around this stuff long enough, then you actually get to know the numbers. I don't know them all, um, but like for example, my uh, brother-in-law Stephen, he, you know, if if you say one of these chips to him, he can usually, oh yeah, that's that's you know, a bunch of NAND gates or that's a you know, exclusive or whatever, um, which I always thought would be pretty cool to be able to do. So let's see, what's this one? This is a 194. Is that that? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, here we go. Uh, hey, Eric. Um, he says there's an original Apple One in a briefcase on display in Maryland. Cool. Um, I can't remember who's been to the the computer museum in um, in San Jose. Does they have an Apple One? But I don't remember. Is it in a wooden? Is it in a wooden case? Does anybody remember? Seven four LS seven four. Um, there we go. And they actually, they also have an Apple One at uh, the uh, Henry Ford Museum in just outside Detroit, because um, I went and saw that a few years ago. So that's super cool. They actually, I think they had a Apple One and an Apple. 2C, um, they had some sort of exhibit which was like the, you know, home from the 80s or something like that. That was pretty funny. So let's see, there's an O2, another one of those. All right, so we're moving along. Um, good. Okay, let's see. And again, I'm trying to be careful, first of all, to not bend any pins when I'm putting them in, and then second of all, um, to make sure that I've got the notch uh, pointed in the correct direction, which is down towards the bottom of the board, um, because putting a chip in backwards is a bad idea. Okay, there's another 555. Um, so here's another timer chip, um, little 555 chip, and this actually controls um, this whole part of the board down here in the lower right is actually the auto start um, for the Apple II um, Plus. So this, this whole section here was not in the original Rev Zero um, when it first came out in 1977. Um, when you booted up that original Apple II, it would just start up with a screen full of garbage and then you actually would have to hit reset to get it to start the 6502 um, and actually start the monitor. And then they added all this circuitry to make it auto start and jump straight into, uh, into the, the ROM. So let's see, 74 LS02. I need another one of those. I guess it would have helped if I would have put them on my sheet in number order, but. Um, oh, silence. I recently saw the Apple One in Prague. It was in perfect condition without a case. Wow, that's super cool. Um, 
A13 is power up reset. Yep. Um, bonsoir. Ah, Philippe. Bonsoir. What, uh, what time is it there? Sorry about my terrible accent. I did take uh, French back in high school, but that was a long time ago. Um, and I took a year of it in college, but it was at 8 a.m. my freshman year. And so I have to admit that I missed quite a few of the classes. Um, so my French is sorely lacking. And here I bent the, bent the crystal. Okay, so let's keep going. So I think we've got everything in the first two rows except for the, um, the video ROM. So we'll run row C now. So this is a LS153. Uh, 153, um, one, five, three. good. There are four of those on the board. Oh, 11 p.m. All right, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for staying up late and joining us. Uh, Philippe, are you, um, I can't remember, I haven't, I, I've looked through the registration list for Kansas Fest, but there's like 400 people on there, but have you, have you signed up for uh, Kansas Fest? Just out of curiosity? Um, we're trying, and the reason I, part of the reason I ask is because we're trying to actually make a lot of the sessions um, be earlier in the morning. It's kind of a, you know, normally when it's in Kansas City and everybody's there in person, then, you know, the, the, it doesn't matter what time stuff is because everybody's already there. But um, since we're doing it uh, remotely, then everybody's going to be in a different time zone. So we can't start it too early because then people say in the Pacific time zone on the West Coast, it's going to be too early for them. And then everyone in Europe and, you know, France and um, it's going to be, you know, late in the afternoon for them. So I think, you know, we're, we're shooting for like between 9.30 a.m. and 4 or 5 p.m. Um, LS04, LS04. And so that'll, you know, that'll be like late afternoon for France um, and then going towards the uh, late evening. Um, so hopefully it's not too horrible. Uh, let's see, 74LS04, good. All right, um, LS257. God, I really hope this works. This is gonna be like super, super sad if it doesn't beep, but Oh well, I guess that would give us an excuse to do another episode. 74 LS51. Uh, what? Yeah, LS51. Okay, there we go. All right, we're getting down on the chips, so that's good. I'd say not quite halfway, uh, but we don't, again, we don't have to put in all the RAM, so I'll probably just put in. Um, just the first bank of RAM, so the C, the C bank, because um, that's all you actually need to get the computer to start up. LS32. Um, let's make sure that's right. Yep. So yeah, you only need 8K of uh, RAM to start up uh, an Apple II. Ooh, wait, wait, gonna bend the pin. Do not shove down. Um, the interesting thing about if I remember correctly, the RAM chips um, for these are, um, so they're each 1K, but you would think that each RAM chip would be uh, independent of all the other ones, but it's actually like each one is one byte of, of the eight, if I'm getting this correct, I think each, one, each RAM chip is one byte out of the, or one bit out of the eight bits uh, for each byte of that 8K, if that makes um, sense. So you need to have the entire bank of RAM filled. Um, otherwise, you know, nothing will work because you won't even have a single uh, full byte of memory. Um, so excellent. Hey, yeah, Philippe, uh, thanks for registering for that. And um, I was just saying earlier that we got in all of the um, so you get like a little Kansas Fest pin um, right here. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Um, so here's the Kansas Fest pin. Um, so I've got 400 of those sitting in a box upstairs and then I'm just waiting on some stickers um, and all those are gonna go out in the mail. And so that's included in your registration um, 
so that's you know free shipping um, anywhere in the world so I think for the US it's obviously gonna cost less to ship so um, we're sort of you know using the extra money to pay for the international folks uh, so sorry people in the US you're sort of maybe subsidizing a little bit but all right so let's see that's the LS 20 okay and jump over here uh, LS 161 so there's that so Javier happy Father's Day was that you with your dad on uh, Facebook Okay, 161. And then there's another 161. Um, these chips look super familiar. I think, weren't these the ones that were causing me... Um, yeah, these are the video addressing. So these chips, all these four chips here are like the video address line. Um, they handle the video address lines. And these were the ones that on my... Um, on another board, they were completely screwed up. And they were causing me heartache. And I ended up having to replace... Um, I think two out of the four chips on that board. Um, yeah, Herb, um, it's, it's actually not that big of a pin. It just looks, I think it just looks big because I'm holding it up. Um, I think it's, it's maybe like an inch and a half by not quite a half inch. Um, so I don't even think it's actually as big as the, the one with the, um, the penguin, the Mark Pelzarski one. Um, I don't think it's as big as that, so it's not, it's not that huge. And then we figured, you know, since we couldn't get be there in person, that we should, um, you know, we might as well just go big on the pin, right? So even though it's virtual, um, I don't actually see any more LS one sixty ones. What is this? That's an LS74. So that's probably the one that goes at the top of the board, right? Um, so, hold on. Um, so, let's see. As Let me just double check. Yeah, that's a 74. So Chris was pointing out earlier, Chris Auger was pointing out, um, here at the top of the board... It's actually mislabeled on Henry's board, so it says 74 uh, LS174. That should just be 74, um, not 174. So I'm going to go ahead and put that chip in now just because I've got it. And this one's a pain because it's right next to the socket. Get this piece of foam. Um, Okay, there's that one. That actually controls the um, cassette. Uh, let's see, that's the cassette out and the speaker sound out. Um, and then we've got, what else? Um, those two chips sort of threw me off there, but we'll just ignore them for now. So let's see, 74LS153, all right. Yeah, Javier, definitely, um, that's nice. My, um, yeah, my dad, unfortunately, he passed away in 1999, so it's been quite a while that he's been gone, um, which is definitely sad. Um, but, yep. So it's nice to, uh, you know, enjoy the day with your dad and everything. It's cool. All right, so let's see, a 153, good. Okay, it's another 153. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting about the Apple II board, you know, the vast, major uh, the vast majority of the chips on the board, you know, aside from things like the RAM, um, are all um, controlling the video circuitry. You know, half the board is basically just getting pixels up on the screen, um, you know, because that's like the most complicated part in terms of the, the the logic and you know especially the way um, Steve Wozniak did it, where he was you know faking the composite uh, color signal, um, you know super clever, but 
um, you know, definitely made for a lot of confusing um, logic and, and, you know, lots and lots of chips, but at the same time, he actually saved a bunch of chips for, for doing it that way. Let's see, what is this, a 283? Um, all right, so those, those LS161s, if I'm missing those, I'll have to just cannibalize them out of my other board, but that's okay. Um, okay, there's that one. Um, LS139. So we're starting to actually, we're, right now we're up by the, uh, the ROM. So a lot of these chips here are going to start to get into like the address lines for, um, you know, controlling the, uh, the address and the data bus on the, uh, the Apple II. So basically, um, the way the, the way the board works, it's got, you know, the 6502, which is the, the, the main CPU. Um, and then it has the ROM chips. And then it has, so the 6502 controls like the 16 address lines. So there's 16 address lines because it's a, um, um, the addresses go from zero up to 65535. Um, so you need 16 bits for that. So that's, that's where those lines in. Um, and then there's eight data lines for the eight bits um, of the computer. And that's why it's an eight bit computer is because the data itself um, is eight bit. Um, let's see, 138. And so these, a lot of these chips up here by the ROM and the, the um, 6502 are controlling whether the 6502 is reading memory from ROM or RAM or writing data out uh, to RAM. Um, and so it's continually switching between those two. Let's see, hold on, 138. I don't wanna get too distracted here. Um, if that's a 138. So, yeah, happy Father's Day to everybody. Um, yes, Comrade Mikhail um, says, well, why did it get color in there compared? Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, I think it was the first, um, somebody can correct me, but I'm pretty sure it was the first uh, home computer with color, um, and just barely maybe beating out, but, but as far as I know, it was the first. Um, and that was definitely kind of, you know, one of its claim to fame. Um, do I have this chip either? The 9334. Why do I not see that one? Um, hold on. I'm getting out my other older board here. Ninety-three thirty-four. All right, let's see. We're just gonna skip that one also. Why do I not see that one? Um, so there's an 08. So yeah, Chris says I was missing one capacitor in my kit, but all that. Okay. Um, yeah, I was also I was missing a capacitor also, but I had it already, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, and then surprisingly, I had one capacitor left over. Um, which really worried me, but I think Henry just accidentally put in an extra one. Um, let's see, what is that, a 138? Yeah. Um, I've still got it just in case I find where it goes, but I don't, I don't, I think I got them all on the board, so I'm pretty sure I'm not missing any capacitors. Um, but Henry's actually, he's, he has really good customer service, so I actually, um, it looks like it might be missing another chip, but uh, when I first got the kit, I was definitely missing a couple chips because um, I tried to count them. And um, Henry just sent them, he sent them right away, like the next day, basically. So that wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. Um, all right, so let's see, what else? Hold on here. Um, 74LS251, there's that one. Okay. Oh, there's an LS replacement for the 9334. Okay, maybe I should pay more attention. Um, 251. 
All right, let's see. There's the 558. So this should be the 558 here. Um, so the 558 is kind of an interesting um, chip. So this is actually two, I think it's, or is it four? Maybe it's four um, 555 timers. Um, so those are the little clock timers. And these are actually used, um, these are used for the game port to control um, the joystick. So when you, um, when you're using a joystick and, it, and, and basically it, um, when it's reading, when it's reading the paddles or the joysticks or something like that, that's what the 555 um, is used for and it measures the, uh, you know, how long the pulse takes to repeat and that timing is based upon that timer plus the capacitors and the resistors right there. Um, well, now you can't see because I'm pointing it. Um, those four resistors there and the four capacitors right there are tied in with the uh, 558 timer and the game port chip there, uh, or the game port connector. Okay, so let's say I need a 138. Um, okay, so Chris is saying that the 9334 should actually be the uh, LS259, um, which I do have. Okay, great. Um, that's good to know. So there's that one, uh, 38 LS04 there. Uh, so we're getting really close. We just have a few chips left. Then we'll be able to flip it on and see. Um, this is actually taking longer than I, sorry that it's taking so long. Um, kind of slow putting these in. Let's see, 8304, that should be this one, yes. Good. Okay. All right. Um, okay, good. Let's see. Um, so the 259. It's that one. That's going to go where the board is labeled 9334. So right over there. So that's the uh, LS259. Um, so now we need a 257. So we only got about five regular chips left. And there's that one. All right, um, we should have another, okay, here's the, what is this, UA7441CP. 74, so this is actually an op amp uh, or an uh, amplifier. And so this is for the, um, for the cassette in. So I gotta make sure to get the dot correct on this guy. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that goes up in the upper corner here, and that amplifies the signal for the uh, cassette input uh, for reading and programs uh, into the computer. All right, so what do we have here? A 367, hold on, I'm gonna bring up, I wanna just double check Henry's, um, can we read this? So, I'm looking at his chart here. Um, I mean, his picture. I've got three, I think the 367, uh, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the 367 is the replacement for the 8197, or sorry, the 8T97. Does that sound correct? Let's see. Let's see it. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, so he's confirming that. Okay, good. Um, oh, and then I have the 161s. I see him. Okay. I missed them somehow. I had 161 on the sheet twice, so I do have all the chips. 
Okay, cool. So that one goes there. Um, but you know, like I said earlier, you know, Henry's really Henry of uh, Reactive Micro is really good about um, you know helping with the kid, or if you're missing parts or something like that, he's more than happy to 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 you know supply you with anything you need, um, or if you goof it up, right? You know, help you fix it. Um, cool. Okay, so there's that one, and then two more of these. Oh, let me let me go back to the video there. Um, yes, or as Eric points in, it points out it's the iPod in jack. Um, yeah, and if you didn't know that, you can actually um, plug. Um, you can plug an iPod or any sort of um, audio in into your Apple II, um, 2 Plus or 2E, and then you can actually load programs. Um, there's a website, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but there's a website that you can go to, um, and you just click on, uh, you know, click on a game, and it'll just play through your, uh, through your computer's um, speaker, the actual um, stream uh, of bits for that game, and then you just plug that into your uh, Apple II, and you can load up um, load up software that way. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll put in some RAM now. So these are the um, RAM chips here. Let me just double check. Uh, 4116, 25NL. All right, so plug those in. And I'm just going to fill in uh, bank C for now. I can do the rest later. Um, Somebody on, I think Facebook was asking why Henry didn't convert this board to use um, 4164s, which are, um, instead of 2K, they must be, uh, what, 16K? Let's see, no, is that right? Four, 8K chips, um, which is what the, the, I believe the Apple, um, 2e uses um, because these are actually hard to find these these 4116s are actually hard to find but you know I think that would sort of defeat the purpose of trying to create a um, you know uh, a clone of a board if you just started randomly using different chips because you know to be realistic you could actually do this entire computer um, you know on a single chip nowadays right or just emulate it on a uh, Raspberry Pi but that would obviously not be the same computer. So I think as long as you can, you know, still find some of these 4164s or 4116s somewhere, then it's better to, you know, have it be as authentic as possible. Um, but you know, the point is valid that they are they are hard to get. So. Um, oh, and Eric, yeah, that's a good point, Eric. Um, he's he says people use it to digitize one bit sound through the cassette input. Um, yeah, so Eric, Eric has actually done a lot with, um, audio on the, um, Apple II. And in fact, he has been involved with, um, the, the Mockingboard music for Nox Archaist. And then he's also done some, uh, presentations on audio, um, at Kansas Fest in the past. Um, and yeah, so he's, he's actually use the cassette input I forgot about that for for digitizing sound so you can do that as well um, and I believe Eric if it, are you doing a presentation at Kansas Fest or are you doing did you submit like a video or something like that is that right right okay Andre good point yeah it's a, it's a replica you're right that's a good um, that's a good point wait before I smash these um yeah yeah ah i bent it no i wish i could find my chip puller i don't know what i did with it you guys see what i did to that one you see that very sad looking pin there. 
the last regular chip to put in. I bent it. Oh man, I totally torqued it. Uh, I'm just gonna get another one and we'll fix that later. Don't tell Henry. Okay, that's better. All right, uh, let's go ahead and put in the, the ROMs now. So here's the video ROM. Um, so that controls all the, the, the way the characters are drawn. Um, and that goes down there. And this one, um, you can actually build like a little adapter to, um, so you can actually use like a regular EE prom. Um, you can't plug an EE prom directly into here, um, but you can build a little adapter in case you wanna have your own character sets uh, with say for example lowercase um, or something like that so that's correct all right um, just looking to make sure I'm doing everything correct here so here's the ROMs now so here's F8 so that's the most important one um, that contains the main um, ROM for the uh, for the Apple II Plus so that's the auto start ROM um, here's F0. Okay, these are kind of scary to plug in. And then we'll plug in the uh, ones. Um, these all contain, these lower ones here contain Applesoft Basic um, in ROM. And E0. Philippe says, don't ruin the board. Yeah, okay. Trying not to. Um, technically, I don't even have to put in all these ROMs, but um, to get it to, to actually boot up. But what what the heck? We might as well just put them all in now. Um, now that we're wait a minute, that one doesn't look quite right. Hold on, before I shove it all the way down and goof it up like the other one. Okay, there we go. The pins for the ROMs are a lot stiffer, so definitely be careful putting those in. Um, seems like they can get bent pretty easy. All right, here's the uh, 6502, so we'll go ahead and put that in. And then just be careful because this one, I'm just double checking here uh, with my other board. Um, this one, the notch goes to the right, um, which is different than, say, the video chip down here. So the video chip, uh, the notch was on the left. For the 6502, the notch is actually um, points to the right. All right, so there's that. Okay, all I have left are a bunch of RAM. Um, everything else is plugged in. I'm just kind of looking at the board to see if I see any pins that are uh, sticking out or not properly seated. Um, so if this doesn't boot up, I think that probably what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through the whole board, look at all the pins, you know, make sure if I see anything that looks wrong. Um, uh, but you know, we will cross our fingers and hope that it just beeps right away and we don't have any problems. All right, so. As far as I can tell, it actually looks pretty good. Should we? Oh, Philippe says, where do the CPUs come from? Um, guess they're not manufactured for years now. Actually, a lot, I'm not sure about all of them, but a lot of these chips are still manufactured. Um, there's actually a lot of equipment that, you know, still uses all these, you know, kind of old, um, old school ICs. Um, certainly not all of them. Some of them are, some of them are like new old stock. Um, but even like the 6502, you know, they, well, like the 65CO2, the one in the Apple IIe, they still manufacture that chip uh, because it's the, using a lot of embedded systems. Um, so embedded hardware, like industrial machinery and stuff like that. Um, so you can actually, you can get, you can get them um, reasonably easily. The only thing is, you know, for some of like the RAM chips, those are tricky. Um, all right, so let's see. I don't know. 
I'm going to assume. Okay, we're going to plug in the speaker. So I got that plugged in. Um, I am going to plug in. Hold on one second. I'm switching. Um, I'm going to plug in the composite video. If I can find the cord, here it is. Uh, all right, so there you can see that's the monitor. Um, you can see me. So sorry, it's like super, super confusing. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and plug in the power supply here. All right, so I got everything plugged in. Um, I've got power. That looks good. The video is plugged in. All right, I'm going to turn it on. Cross your fingers. We have a beep. That's good. Uh, anything on the monitor? Yes. Look at that. Apple II. Whoop, where'd it go? I wonder if it's losing the... Uh, it might be my monitor. Rats, hold on. Uh, do I have another... Let me get my other monitor and see. That LCD might not want to sync um, to the composite video. Hold on. Plug it into the little night owl and see if that can do a better job. Uh, there we go. Cool. All right, can everybody see that? Um, hopefully. I think so. Uh, so let's see. If I, I had a little wire here. Um, so obviously I don't have a keyboard plugged into this. So I can't actually. Um, here, let me let me switch this back to OBS there. Um, so I can't, uh, wait a minute, uh, pay no attention to the, there's the audio right there. Um, so what is he saying here? So Chris says bang 6502 pin 40 low. Um, is that just going to reset the board basically? Because I was just going to do the same thing with the keyboard. Um, so I know if I connect pin 3 to pin 8, that's the same as um, hitting a reset on the keyboard. Yep. So. All right. So I think it actually worked. First try. Um, so let's see. Let me, I can leave that up there. Um, where's my... OBS here so we can make sure to yeah, so I'm still in there um, So it looked like it, the, everything actually worked properly the um, The kit was actually, you know, pretty easy to assemble relatively it took it took a fair while I, I guess it took maybe What three YouTube sessions plus about maybe four evenings? Um, of like a couple hours each so maybe 10 to 12 hours total of soldering and putting in chips um, but none of it was actually that tricky or difficult. Um, there's just a couple little minor things with the board that Henry's going to fix. Um, but that other than that, you know, that, that was pretty straightforward. Um, what will you do to test the RAM? So I think Eric, that's a good question. I think what I'll do is I'll actually, I'll just take the keyboard out of my Apple II plus, even though I hate to do that. Um, and I'll just hook it up. Um, and then I can I can plug in a uh, I can plug in a floppy drive and uh, just fire up a, a diagnostics disk or something like that. Um, yeah, comrade uh, Mikhail asks about add more RAM now. Um, obviously, I would want to turn it off and unplug it before I added more RAM. I don't think I really need to do that right now. Um, I'm pretty confident the RAM will work fine. Um, it works fine with 8K, so um, it should work or. Actually, it's 
16K. Sorry, I think I misspoke earlier. Um, yeah, so it should, you know, if it works fine with the 16K, then it should work fine with the 48K as well. Um, next thing I'll probably do is, yeah, try the keyboard, make sure that all looks good. But the fact that we actually got to the uh, basic prompt and the reset worked and we heard the beep, um, I'm pretty confident that everything's actually working properly. You know, one, one thing that would be really good to try is actually graphics, so high res and low res graphics uh, to make sure all the video circuitry is correct. Um, hey, Steven, that's my brother in law. Happy Father's Day. Um, yeah, so, oh, and Steven, I don't know if you saw it, but I used your oscilloscope earlier to, uh, to uh, test out the, the clock signal. Um, so that's actually his oscilloscope, his Tektronics from back in the day um, that he gave uh, to the Media Archaeology Lab. And I borrowed it back from there since they're closed right now um, because of the virus. But uh, so, yeah, Andre, I know I need to get a case. So maybe that'll be my next episode. But anyway, hey, thanks, you guys, for um, for staying with me. I know this was a long episode, but uh, you stuck with it and uh, everything worked great. Um, feel free to leave more comments after uh, after I stop the stream. And um, otherwise, thanks for... Thanks for all your help. Thank you, especially uh, Chris Auger, for all the advice and everything like that. Having you, uh, just having built one of these, that was super helpful. Um, so kudos to uh, Chris for for kind of being the first one to, to try this. And again, this is Henry's Reactive Micro Kit. Um, so yeah, look for it. I'll have some notes in the, uh, uh, the notes for the video. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.